Good morning. You are with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. Um, we are meeting this morning to go through um, S-124, which came over to us from the Senate uh, back towards the end of June. Um, and so Betsy Ann has some documents that she has shared with Andrea that are posted on our um, on our website, and uh, and we're going to go through the bill and uh, and take some questions right now. So thank you, Betsy Ann, and I think that uh, as we did yesterday, we will look at the bill language on our other devices so that we can all see each other. Oh, Betsy, and you're muted. Oh, sorry. Hello. Perfect. I'll start over. Betsy Ann Rass, Legislative Council. We are reviewing S-124 as passed Senate, um, which is an act relating to governmental structures protecting the public health, safety, and welfare. Uh, thank you to Andrea for posting these various documents for today. We've got the bill as passed the Senate itself. Um, we've got a summary that I maybe will be good to review this morning, Madam Chair. We can do more of a higher level walk through and then we can get down into the nitty gritty um, at a later time. Um, I did also, part, part of this bill addresses um, issues concerning law enforcement officer training, certification and professional regulation. So there is also a document posted um, providing an overview of those topics. And then finally, there's just a legal reference guide of the different law enforcement structures that we have in the state. And it also addresses a few um, law enforcement related issues that the general that seem to come up in the General Assembly um, as it has been discussing public safety issues in the last several bienniums. One of the bills that the General Assembly recently passed was S-273 from the 2017-18 biennium. That bill did get vetoed and um, there was not any vote on override. Uh, so some of those provisions are repeated in S-124 and I'll try to highlight um, some of the repeat of the provisions. I think if members wanna follow along, the two main documents we'll review this morning, unless you wanna get into further details, will be that summary of S-124. And you can also have the bill pulled up if we wanna look at language directly. But um, Madam Chair, if it seems to work, I can just do more of higher level uh, walkthrough and then we can get back into the language at a later date if that um, makes sense. Yep. So I am going to be looking mostly at the summary but it does go through and provides the different topics of the bill and then points out the sections of the bill where you can find this in a language. But big picture, this bill covers law enforcement, dispatch, emergency medical services, and public safety planning. And it starts out with law enforcement and specifically the Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council. So overall, the Vermont Com Criminal Justice Training Council is our state entity that uh, provides training for and approves training for our law enforcement officers. It certifies officers and all officer has to, all uh, people have to be certified as a law enforcement officer um, in order to exercise law enforcement authority. And then it also professionally regulates our law enforcement officers. Uh, it's a group of uh, appointees and uh, the membership of the council was addressed in this bill and that was also addressed in S-273 from last biennium. The bill starts out with a technical correction um, because in the statute that describes the purpose of the council, the purpose, uh, one of the main purposes is to provide training uh, to recruits and those are people who are not yet certified as law enforcement officers and then law enforcement officers themselves who have to get annual training to renew their certification. And so actually statute got changed by mistake a couple few years ago to say recruitment instead of recruits um, when this is really supposed to be talking about law enforcement applicants. So 
as passed the Senate, this bill would make a technical correction to change recruitment back to recruit. But as Senate GovOps was discussing this bill in a, a separate section, testimony from the council actually was that they're trying to move away from that term recruit um, and instead use law enforcement applicant. So I just have flagged for you here a potential technical correction to the technical correction, if you will be sending back any amendments, there's an opportunity to update that language to use law enforcement applicant instead of recruit. But section two gets into a substantive issue and that's the membership of the council. Um, so right now the council is made up of 12 members. This section would amend the council membership and change who gets to a point and um, would change the membership from 12 to 20 people. Um, and the membership of the council was something that was addressed in S-273. So the bill would provide that aside from 17 specific appointees with specific people, you're either serving ex officio because of the office you hold or you get appointed. The governor would also be able to appoint three public members who don't have a law enforcement connection. Only the public members would get per diem compensation, but all members could get reimbursement of expenses. Uh, related to this, section three permits existing members of the council to continue to serve um, out their existing terms if their membership got revised, but they'd still be serving. The bill then moves on to different training options for officers and contingent access to council training. Now different training options was a matter that was addressed in S-273 in big picture, um, what the General Assembly has discussed before and what Senate GovOps was uh, focusing on in, again in S-124 was the access to training, what training is appropriate, um, and to how to get people trained up. Because I think you'll hear from uh, law, the law enforcement community that um, they, they don't maybe have enough law enforcement officers. And so how, how to make it easier for law enforcement officers to get trained. So section four of this bill would require the Criminal Justice Training Council to adopt rules for alternate routes to certification, aside from the training that's provided at the Vermont Police Academy. Our police academy, um, if you've been there before, is in Southern Vermont. And you'll see for our some of our officers, the highest level certified officers actually will have to go to the police academy and do, I think it's a 16 or week residential um, training there at the academy. So that is one uh, issue that this bill addresses. And this section is requiring the council to consider and adopt rules on other ways to get trained up other than at the police academy. And also it says that the council shall strive to offer courses in different areas of the state and non overnight courses whenever possible. This is uh, permissive as opposed to you shall. So the language is written in two different ways. And we can, if you wanna look at the bill, this is on, get there real quick. Section four begins on page four. And so the council would be required to adopt rules to identify and implement alternate routes to certification aside from training at the police academy. Now. How many hours could be outside of the police academy? I think that under this language would be up to the um, council to decide, but that is a requirement. But then at the bottom of the page, you'll see there it's council shall offer courses um, in different areas of the state. So that is a requirement, but then it's strive to or, uh, offer non overnight co courses whenever possible. So that's more permissive. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, section five, I'm on, uh, going back to the summary, I'm at the top of page two, section five of the bill requires the council to restructure its programs so that on July 1, 21, a level two officer can use portfolio, experiential learning, or CLEP testing, that's college level examination program testing to transition 
from level two to level three without needing to restart the certification process. So what's going on here is right now, we have three levels of law enforcement officer certification. Level one, which is the most restrictive and it's uh, limited to security, transport, and a few other things, but we'll get into the def definition of that. I don't even think we have any level one officers right now certified, but that certification level is available. Level two is the mid-level certification. and that by statute allows a person who's level two certified to only investigate and handle a specified uh, list of crimes. And then level three is full law enforcement authority. And what's going on now that this bill would address is right now the council's programs are not structured so you can go from level two to level three easily. Essentially, a person who's level two and wants to get level three certified has to start the re whole recertification process. And so this would uh, require the council to restructure its program. So a person can transition from the experience they have now as level two and then work their way up to level three without having to go through level three training all over. Section six requires the council to report to the mm. the GovOps committee. Is frozen. Betsy Ann, can you start okay. over um, at section six because you froze for a moment? Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, Section six requires the council to report to the GovOps committees at the, in January about its progress on these requirements with a final rule adoption deadline of July 1, 23. Section 6A was added to the bill. So the, the council, the, it's providing the training, it's certifying officers. You need the council to get certified and to get recertified. Section 6A provides that beginning on January 1, 22, a law enforcement agency would be prohibited from having its officers trained at the police academy or otherwise using council services if the agency is not in compliance with the statutory requirements for collecting road stop data or the requirement to comply with any policy re um, required on the council chapter, like the taser policy, for example. So you have to be in compliance as an agency if you wanna use the services of the council. Um, the section requires the council to adopt procedures about how it's gonna enforce this. And those procedures could allow waivers for agencies under a plan to obtain compliance. Hmm. Uh, section seven, so that's six A. Oops, pardon. Oh, Bob Hooper has a question. So, uh, thank you. Uh, Betsy Ann, can you only at this point access the academy uh, through an agency or can you do it sort of, I don't know, independent study or whatever the term might be? I so, believe we should hear testimony directly from the council. I believe the practice is you have to be sponsored by an agency um, to be able to be trained up there. Okay. Well, one of the things this bill is looking at is you know, whether some of the, um, a person could obtain some of the educational requirements at one of our colleges, for example. That's something this bill is getting at. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So you referenced um, the, the requirement for collecting roadside stop data yes. and other requirements um, in this chapter but but then there's this sort of out that says um, you can, as long as you're uh, under a plan to become compliant, you can still access. Um, I'm not sure that it takes a whole lot of planning to become compliant with the roadside data stop. And so I would, um, I would wanna consider making that a firm requirement and that if there are other more complicated um, requirements of this chapter that that would more reasonably require a, a compliance plan, that that would be the only out. And committee, you can weigh in if you disagree with me on that, but it seems to me that since we've been trying to collect data for quite some time now, mm -hmm. um, 
we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't have agencies around the state who are not complying with that. Uh, Bob Hooper has a question. I, I don't disagree with you at all. I just I wonder, <clears throat> is the reporting requirement uh, mechanically based in terms of how it has to be done? Is that a roadblock at any point? You know, you have to have a special program or a special system or something that would prohibit the smaller towns from jumping right into it. And I, I don't we, know. I don't know the answer. Yeah, I think we heard some testimony um, back when we were physically together in committee that uh, that the data comes in in a variety of ways, from back of the envelope to uh, you know to uploading from a database, kind of. Uh, um, Rob. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm not necessarily disagreeing with you. The only concern that I have is it does seem to me that there is a couple different reporting systems out there. And what would it take to, well, basically have everybody coalesce around one, <clears throat> excuse me, one system. And then if I recall, there's also variations of how that information is interpreted and therefore how it's input. So um, as much as I hear what you're saying, and I, I don't necessarily disagree, I'd like to know logistically what it would take to get from where we are to where we'd like to be yep. in that regard. Yeah, I think it would be a good idea for this committee to actually hear some testimony from some of the smaller uh, agencies around the state and understand what their, uh, what their data collection and reporting challenges are. I know that we also heard from Commissioner Sherling that he would like to share his, uh, his um, I forget what the name of the program is, the platform that, that Vermont State Police uses, um, but he would like to be able to make that available to all law enforcement agencies. Um, I don't recall whether that is in his budget plans for either this year or next. If sure. anybody else has information about that, feel free to jump in. And, and by pursuing it from this angle here, are, aren't we addressing the, the statewide concern about having uniformity and consistency statewide in a variety of areas? That's the idea. All right, back to you, Betsy Ann. All right, um, so on the summary, I'm in section seven on page two. Um, this section would explicitly permit one law enforcement agency to seek certification from the council for any in-service training it provides to its own officers or officers of another agency. It's really getting at providing training officers of another agency. This is actually already happening in practice as I understand it. So this is statute just catching up with reality. And this was a um, correction that was proposed in S-273 also, just to clarify that statutory authority. All right, we're on to another topic now, the potential hiring agency duty to contact an officer's current agency when an officer is trying to uh, apply, is applying for um, a new position at that potential hiring agency. So this section eight would require a potential hiring law enforcement agency to contact the officer's current agency about the officer's performance there, if the officer's still employed there. And that current agency would be risk required to disclose its analysis of the officer's performance there. So it's essentially issue spotting um, when a potential hiring agency is considering hiring an officer. Um, so this is just an update to current statutory law. The note here is that law already requires a potential hiring agency to contact an officer's former agency if the officer's no longer employed there and for that former agency to disclose why the officer's no longer employed there. Uh, section nine is a transitional provision. It was included in the same law that enacted that um, duty to contact the former agency. It's, it waives this requirement 
um, in the case of an existing non-disclosure agreement that prohibits this disclosure. So in case there's any sort of labor agreement in effect, um, a uh, current agency would not be required to disclose if that language is included in their contract currently. The bill goes on to address body cameras. Um, Section 9A provides that on January 1, 22, each agency is required to adopt, follow, and enforce the LEAB's model body-worn camera policy. I provided a link to it there for you, which the LEAB was required to establish via that 2016 act. And each law enforcement officer is required to comply with the provisions of that policy. So LEAB, meaning the Law Enforcement Advisory Board, um, the bill requires the council to incorporate this requirement into its training. And I just provided a note there that this policy applies when an agency actually authorizes an officer to use a body camera. So I think that there's potential um, uh, clarification of the language, just how it came through to make it clear that this only is required if um, uh, the requirement to follow the policy is only a requirement for an officer if the officer is actually using a body camera. So we can look at that language more closely when we do a more detailed walkthrough. I'm at the top of page three now and the bill gets into unprofessional conduct. So unprofessional conduct provisions were really beefed up uh, pursuant to the 2017 Act number 56. If you hear testimony about Act 56, it refers to that 2017 Act. Um, big picture. 2017 Act Number 56 really expanded the uh, scope of authority for the council to professionally regulate officers. Before the provisions of Act 56 took effect on July 1, 2018, the council only had the authority to decertify an officer and decertification was only allowed if the officer was convicted of a felony or failed to complete in-service training. That's it. So it was decertification or nothing and only on those two grounds, felony conviction or failure to complete training. Act 56 established a variety of unprofessional conduct provisions. Um, and there are three categories. Category A, which relates to crimes. Category B, which I describe as gross professional misconduct. And category C, which relates to council processes, and this could be falsifying documents to the council or um, failing to comply with a training requirement, for example. What these sections of the bill are doing is uh, really addressing, uh, a big focus is on category B. So the first thing that's going on here is that it's making explicit right now what the law says is category B. There's a list of them. And right now the language in the law says that category B is gross misconduct, such as, and it provides a list of uh, different conduct. So it sounds more like examples rather than shall be category B conduct. I'll read you some of them. So if you wanna look at the bill, you can see them yourselves. Category B, is listed as including, I'm at the bottom of page 11 of the bill, sexual harassment involving physical contact or misuse, misuse of position, um, misusing your position for personal or economic gain, excessive use of force under color of authority, second offense is what the law currently provides, bias enforcement, and using electronic criminal records database for personal, political, or economic gain. So right now, the statute says that those are examples, it's like such as these lists of A through E. The bill makes clear that category B means shall include that list and include means it's not an exhaustive list. So that's more of a clarification. Jim has a question. Yeah, thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Betsy Ann, so does this track um, what we passed in 219 a few months ago. Oh, Betsy on your 19. Yeah, let's see. I would have to look that up. I think you were addressing 
some issues in there, but I have to remind myself, uh, since I'm, I didn't handle that bill, I just need to find out what you did there. I'm in the bill now. Yes, so you did make that correction. Okay, you did make that correction, shall include. Okay, so that's already there. We can let's, I'll make a note of that. Thank you, Representative Harrison, that shall include is in there. Um, but then yes, and then you did add on to the list of category B conduct. Okay, thank you. And you already made the change. All right, great. So you already made the change for excessive use of force. You change it from first, the second offense to first offense. So, sorry so about that. I didn't realize you made out. that change. So can some of this come out of this bill then? Yeah, definitely. Okay. And that would be good because S219 is already enacted in the law. And that changing of, S, of uh, excessive use of force from second offense to first offense, it does have uh, a ripple effect throughout the chapter and I just describe it here on page three. We don't have to rehash it because you've already done it. So you can take it off your list. Thank you. So I am on the summary on page three. Uh, let me just make sure this is not already addressed in your bill. Um, so section 10 and 2403A1B is changing the language about when an agency has to report alleged category B conduct. Right now, the language of the law says that the, an agency has to report to the council alleged category B conduct if the agency receives a complaint against the officer that the agency deems credible as a result of a valid investigation. Then they report the category B allegation. This revises this language to say that the agency is required to report credible allegations of category B conduct before the agency goes through the whole process of conducting its valid investigation. So it's more of the agency doing a preliminary screen of the complaint if it does have credibility, it's not just, you know, an officer did X, Y, Z yesterday, but the officer is, you know, was away on vacation. For example, um, the agency would know that that's not a credible complaint. Um, but if it, there is a credible complaint, then the agency under the bill would be required to report it to the council. So the council is more aware of the complaints of a complaint against an officer. Um, and then the council would have more oversight as the agency itself conducts its investigation of that category B allegation. So this is self-reporting within an agency. Are there other channels through which a credible um, complaint could be elevated to the training council? Yes, complaints can be made directly to the council, for example. Um, then there's also language further in the bill that is going to request a recommendation on whether there should be other channels um, for people to make complaints of um, allegations of officer unprofessional conduct. But right now, I, the two main ones are to the agency itself or to, directly to the Criminal Justice Training Council. Do you know of any, any place where we could see a listing of the different law enforcement agencies and the, and the size of each of them? Because I know in my small community, we have maybe two full-time and another part-time officer. Um, and I, you know, it occurs to me that in the smaller the agency, the harder it might be to, uh, for a credible complaint to to be handled within simply within the agency. Yeah, let me look around to see if there's uh, you know VLCT might have a list. Um, I will I will do some research to see um, if we can get a list of those agencies. Great in the state. Uh, Alexa. Yeah. <laughs> John Gannon. <laughs> 
Um, I, I believe that Vermont State Police has such a list, which okay. I will discuss when we get to dispatch these. I would think the Training Council would as well. <clears throat> yeah, I bet. I bet somebody's watching right now on YouTube and uh, and that our inbox um, may actually uh, receive one of these things, one of these <coughs> lists. Thank you. Yeah, good call, Rep. LeClaire. That's probably the best best bet. See if the, what the council has. Um, I'm on the summary, top of page four. Um, this language in 2403B would require the council to provide a copy of any report it receives um, from an agency about alleged unprofessional conduct and the relevant documents that the agency forwards on um, to what is called the council advisory committee. Um, and the council advisory committee would be required to recommend any appropriate action to take. So the Council Advisory Committee was created as part of Act 56 um, as a five member board. There's four public members and one retired officer. Um, they're to be appointed by the governor to provide advice to the council on its duties in regard to professionally regulating officers. So it's getting to more uh, public oversight of allegations against officers. On page four, it's getting to those recommendations that I referenced. So section 10A would require specified entities in consultation with other entities that the bill specifies um, to report to the GovOps committees by next January with recommendations on various issues in regard to law enforcement. So the bill spells out who these um, reporting entities have to consult with, but I've just provided here um, who the final reporter uh, has to be on who has to make these recommendations. So the first subject covered is law enforcement officer qualifications and the law enforcement advisory board would need to provide recommendations on universal standards for interviewing and hiring officers. And relatedly, the council would need to make recommendations on cultural sensitivities in and overall appropriateness of exams that officers have to take. Another topic is law enforcement officer training. Um, so the council would need to report back with recommendations as to whether the current officer training appropriately covers cultural awareness, implicit bias, de-escalation, and recognition of and responding to people who have a mental health condition, and whether that training is embedded into training on other policing policies such as traffic stops and searches. After taking a look at that, the council would also have to recommend any amendments to statutorily required training that might not be necessary for all officers. So in that separate document that I uh, provided that provides the list of training of officers, it does go through what the statutory requirements are. The council is given um, a, a authority to decide a lot of what the appropriate training should be, but statute does control them on some of the topics. And so this is a look at whether all of that statutorily required training is necessary for all officers. Then the council, the LEAB and Department of Public Safety jointly would need to make recommendations regarding the governmental oversight of the council. Right now, the council really is, it's not under any agency umbrella. It is um, an independent entity. So they would have to recommend whether it should be put under a, a certain governmental umbrella in the state. Also make recommendations about the location of the police academy and the basic training requirements for applicants. Um, as I mentioned, for level three, the highest level officers, they, if you um, just to point out on the overview of their training requirements, it's on page four of that um, overview. It is a 16 week residential basic training um, academy. Um, and the classes run Monday through Friday. And during the week, students are required to remain there at the academy. Um, and so one of the things that uh, report back when just need to analyze whether um, that might be uh, limiting the number of people who might want to have an, a career in law enforcement and whether it, training can be provided in different ways. 
Um, back to the bill overview, uh, a third topic that needs to be recommended is um, models of civilian oversight where the attorney general's office would need to recommend some models for civilian oversight of law enforcement. Um, also a fourth topic, reporting allegations of misconduct. And this is going to what you were asking about, Madam Chair. Um, the AGO, Attorney General's Office, would have to recommend and identify a central point to report allegations of officer misconduct and how to handle them. Um, so right now you can make your complaints to the agency or the council and the question would be whether there's other places that people could be able to make um, complaints. A fifth topic is access to complaint information. And here the council advisory committee would need to make recommendations on public access to records of alleged officer misconduct and any substantiations of that conduct. A sixth topic is body cameras and the LEAB would need to recommend any necessary changes to its body warn camera policy before that requirement for agencies to comply with it takes effect. Um, and then also policies for responding to Public Record Act requests for the footage. Uh, also in regard to body cameras, Department of Public Safety would need to um, take a look at and recommend whether it's possible to have a statewide group purchasing co contract for body cameras and central storage locations to address some of the financial issues um, related to obtaining body cameras. And then finally, a seventh topic is military equipment and the LEAB would need to recommend a statewide policy on officers use of military equipment. Some of the feedback was there's a variety of equipment that officers and agencies can get uh, military equipment. And sometimes people think of, you know, armory and tanks, but they're also getting snowmobiles and um, snowblowers. <laughs> so a, a policy on what is appropriate and what might not be appropriate. Jim Harrison. Um, thank you. B uh, Betsy Ann, again, back on 219, um, you might want to check. I thought we asked um, uh, public safety to relook at the body camera policy, but I, I, there was a lot of things in and out, so I, I, I may not, I don't have the bill in front of me, but um, <clears throat> if we did, I just don't want to duplicate it in a slightly different way with a different console if 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 we ask different people to review it. Yes, thank you. I'm I'm looking at 219 now, Act 147. I'm seeing the body camera section, section seven and eight. It it appears that it's uh, focused on Department of Public Safety alone, but I'll yes. take another comb through. I'll I'll take a, a closer look at that act um, to make sure it's not being duplicated here. So thanks for that reminder. Yeah, no, we, we, it was only state police, but I thought we had asked them to update the policy. But I again, that I may be recalling that incorrectly. Okay, I will look. I will look. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, so that takes us through the real um, law enforcement specific um, council language. And so on the summary, I'm at the top of page five and the bill gets into the Vermont Crime Information Center, AKA the VCIC. And so this section 11 would require VCIC to establish and provide training on a uniform list of definitions for officers to use when they enter their crime data into their system of records. So there's two main systems of record keeping for agencies. The, they either use Spillman or Valcor are the two systems. And testimony on the Senate side had been that uh, not all agencies are using the same definition. So crimes are getting reported in different ways. One crime might be reported in one way by one agency and a different way by another agency. So there's not consistency in the data. And so this would require VCIC to come up with a uniform list of definitions so that all agencies are talking in the same language whenever they do enter their um, criminal records into whatever system that they do use. And officers would be required to use those definitions when they do enter their crime data. 
Then the bill goes on to the Law Enforcement Advisory Board, the LEAB, and one of the things that it's doing is just putting the LEAB in the right place in statute where it should go. Right now it's in Title 24, which is our municipal law title, and it really shouldn't be there because it's not a municipal law entity. It is created as being within the Department of Public Safety, so this would repeal where it currently lives in statute and put it in the chapter of Title 20, which is our public safety title, under the Department of Public Safety chapter. Uh, and just recodify it there with the main changes while doing so is to add members to the LEAB, four new members. Um, Department of Fish and Wildlife would get a representative, um, DMV would get a representative, the Chief of Capitol Police would be added, and so would a VSEA appointed officer. And so it then updates the quorum and makes a few other technical corrections, but no other changes to the duties of the LEAB or what it's supposed to do in moving the statute over. Um, and section 14 is a transitional provision just to say, all right, it now says it's in Title 24, now it's in Title 20, all references to the old Title 24 section are meant to be the new Title 21 and Ledge Council would be required to update the statutes accordingly with the new cross-reference. Um, if you could hold up just a moment, I think Bob Hooper had his hand up for a moment before we, before we transition to this um, section. Bob, did you have a question? Well, a, a puzzle maybe. Uh, Betsy Ann, does the, the Vermont equivalent of the NCIC, doesn't NCIC use a, a standard reporting form that you would think would have filtered down? I don't know the answer to that. Um, I think it's is Jeff Whalen, Mr. Whalen, I think is the, uh, or, uh, oh, what is the uh, director of the uh, VCIC? It probably would be a good witness for um, providing testimony on the current definition and the issues that um, agencies are experiencing or the VCIC is experiencing with the different definitions. Um, I know it was a concern on the Senate side, but I just, I can't give you all the details on why, why there is an ongoing issue, but it was, there was an issue identified with the definitions being used. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Mike Merwicki. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Betsy, are, are there civilians on this board? I don't believe so. We can look at the LEAB. You can see the current um, members. If you wanna take a look at the bill, they're all law enforcement related. And the membership is set out on page 19 of the bill. I, there, I, I don't think there are public members. Um, so remember they're just adding the four law enforcement members to it. That's what's going on here, starting on page 19 of the bill. <clears throat> There is a representative of the VLCT. Um, the is there anything prohibiting us from adding civilians? No, no, you can. Um, you can do so if you choose. Yeah, Defender General, and otherwise, it's all it's all law enforcement positions. So the General Assembly did create it to be advisory, but um, as I noted in the um, the legal reference guide, although it was created as advisory, it does have, um, it, the General Assembly has given it certain substantive powers, such as the authority to uh, establish the required taser policy. And then another example is that uh, body camera policy. But you may choose to add or uh, revise the current membership if you want. And I may do that. Thank you. <laughs> I'm back on the summary, the bottom of page five. And then just one other uh, note about the LEAB. Section 15 would require the LEAB in its annual report in 2021, because it is required to do an annual report, um, to specifically recommend ways that towns can increase access to law enforcement services. And this was something addressed in S-273 also. Now I'm on the summary at the top of page six and we're getting into dispatch in the Department of Public Safety. So the first thing that's going on here, there's some technical corrections too. Um, 
getting rid of some outdated language. Um, the first bit of outdated language uh, that would be eliminated is a statutory requirement for the commissioner to be appointed for a term of six years. That's not happening in practice um, because all appointees serve, all governor appointees to serve at the pleasure of the governor. And that six year term relates to another provision I'll get to in a moment um, that's just been sitting dead in the law for over four decades that you could clean up while you have the chance in this bill. But a substantive thing going on in section 16 is requiring the commissioner of public safety to adopt rules that provides the rates that department of public safety charges to perform dispatch functions. So DPS already has a statutory authority to charge rates, um, but there's no, uh, right now what the bill would do is say, um, there needs to be rules that show how the rate making, um, what the rates would be if DPS does charge for dispatch. Um, relatedly to this, I'll just note in section 17, um, in regard to that rulemaking on dispatch rates, those rules would need to be in place by July 1, 21, but the bill requires the rules to provide a minimum of three years following adoption before the rates they contain are imposed. So it'd be a three year rule rollout. As I understand it, although DPS has the authority to do charge for dispatch, it is not doing so. I, that's my understanding. Um, this bill would say, once you do adopt those rates in rule, three years before they can take effect to allow municipalities, for example, to uh, prepare for those getting charged those rates. Jim and then John. Uh, thank you. Um, Betsy, and I think you might have answered part of my question. So it's your understanding currently that uh, the Department of Public Service uh, Safety does not charge any dispatch fees. Um, that's, that's my understanding. We should get confirmation from the commissioner, but that was my okay. understanding from the conversation. Um, and, and it seems to me previous testimony from the prior commissioner that the state police did this service for something like 105 communities. I may have that number wrong, but it's a significant number of municipalities, which probably tend to be very small, and very rural. Um, so this is a very significant, this whole section is a very, very significant change um, and, and could put a burden on uh, many of those small rural communities, even if, um, you know, it's based on a per call uh, basis, if there's any kind of minimum. So um, I, I, I'm just concerned about this section without really knowing what it's gonna mean in the end. Thank you. Thanks, yeah, I, I would say definitely have testimony from the commissioner on um, the commissioners, how the commissioner envisions this happening. John. So I, I am sure the commissioner is very well aware of section 17 um, because he, I'm sure he testified about it in Senate government operations. Um, but I'm concerned because I received a letter from my police chief yesterday um, from Captain Lance Bur Bur Burnham who's with the Vermont State Police, um, telling all law enforcement agencies that they're gonna start charging for dispatch in FY22, which is inconsistent with this language. Mm -hmm. And it concerns me more because they acknowledge that many local law enforcement agencies have raised concerns about the accuracy and the fairness of those fees, um, yet they have not responded to that, citing budgetary reasons for not responding. They're yet again asking them to respond to the proposed fees when they haven't taken into account local law enforcement agencies' concerns in the first place. So I do want to hear a lot of testimony um, with respect to what the, the state police are doing and why they are, you know, pushing out to towns information that's inconsistent with this, this bill. Um, because it impacts a lot of towns, including Bradford, Richmond. Killington, Chittenden, Bennington Sheriffs, and Wilmington. 
Well, Thanks. join the club. <laughs> Thank you, John. I appreciate that. We will uh, we will certainly need to take some testimony on that, both from the uh, DPS perspective, but also from the local perspective. All right. One other thing going on here that I'll mention in section 16 is uh, a technical correction, but it would repeal 20 VSA 1873, which right now in writing says the governor can only remove the commissioner of public safety after charges, a hearing if the commissioner requests one and only for specific grounds and that's it. Um, but the Vermont Supreme Court in a 1979 case held that that statute 20 VSA 1873 was superseded by a later enacted statute 3 VSA 2004 that says gubernatorial appointees hold office at the pleasure of the governor. So this 20 VSA 1873 has just been essentially sitting in statute and writing wrong for over four decades. So you have the chance right now to get it out of the law because it conflicts with judicial um, case law, which controls. So that's your technical cleanup there. All right, so the bill, that's the end of our law enforcement topic. Then the bill goes into emergency medical services and I'm in the middle of page six of the summary. Um, so throughout this bill or throughout section 18 of the bill, one thing would be uh, substituting the Department of Health for the State Board of Health um, that divides the state into EMS districts and issues licenses for ambulance services and first responder services. And that was a proposal earlier this year, this biennium by uh, Department of Health. Uh, in regard to ambulance service license eligibility criteria, uh, in section 18, 24 VSA 2681 would require ambulance service license and renewal applicants to provide their services in a non-discriminatory manner um, similar to the requirement for home health services. Seneca of Ops was referring to this as the anti-cherry picking um, uh, provision so that there would need to be an analysis that ambulance services um, are providing their services in a non-discriminatory manner. And one uh, witness that was uh, crucial on the Senate side, there are many for EMS, but I'd say um, Drew Hazelton um, was a big resource for Senate GovOps. Um, he's one of our uh, EMS providers and he would probably be a good um, one witness that he could speak to about the because that this request came from um, him. He serves on the EMS advisory committee. So that's one possible witness on this issue to address, uh, to discuss some of the issues with that um, discriminatory services that are alleged right now. I'm at the top of page seven and the section 19 would require the Green Mountain Care Board to identify priorities regarding EMS resources and needs in the state's health resource allocation plan that it puts together. So it's just an analysis of the healthcare needs in the state. And so this would require the HRAP to also address EMS resources and needs. And related to this, section 20 of the bill would require the EMS advisory committee to identify those resources and needs and report them to the Green Mountain Care Board for uh, the care board to um, consider that and put that in the HRAP. So I just should have said up front, well, I'm sure you, you all know it, but um, the EMS system is also under um, stress and getting people to be able to get uh, licensed as EMS providers. And so what part of what this bill is doing is trying to address the um, EMS uh, resources that we need in the state. On page seven, there is also a technical correction um, in section 20 to address a change that was made in 2020 act number 100. That was the GovOps public safety bill in response to COVID in that bill that um, eliminated the requirement for EMS personnel to be credentialed by their affiliated agencies because it was just one other thing that the EMS personnel had to do. EMS personnel still have to be licensed and licensure requires you to be certified um, nationally, um, but Act 100 re removed the additional credentialing requirement by an EMS uh, professional's affiliated agency, which is their ambulance service or first responder service. Um, so 
But in doing eliminating that credentialing requirement, there was uh, some elimination of language that um, seemed to delete language about a requirement to still be affiliated with an affiliated agency. Big picture, you have to to be able to practice as an EMS personnel, you have to be affiliated with either an ambulance service or a first responder service. I couldn't get licensed and just start going out, holding myself out as an EMS, uh, as a paramedic, for example. I have to actually be working for an affiliated agency. And so section 20 would just ensure that there's still a requirement to be affiliated with an affiliated agency as a follow-up to the Act 100 changes. And there are a few other technical corrections in there to use the appropriate defined terms. Another thing the bill does is um, would require three levels of EMS instructors. Right now, by EMS rule, there's one license level for to be an EMS instructor. It's called the EMS instructor slash coordinator. And this would require the Department of Health to establish by rule at least three license levels. Again, this is just addressing um, the lack of um, training, for example, that's available to um, people who want to get licensed as EMS personnel. Another concern that EMS personnel uh, were discussing on the Senate side is some of the testing necessary to get licensed. So there's uh, a requirement right now in DOH rule to get um, NREMT psychomotor skills testing, the National I think, Registry of Emergency Medical Technicians. Um, there was concern about whether the psychomotor testing by e and NREMT was always appropriate. So this section 20 would allow for demonstration of skills competencies as part of approved education to test psychomotor skills of emergency medical responders and emergency medical technicians as an alternative to the current rule requirement to take that NREMT psychomotor skills exam. So again, I'd recommend um, the witnesses, EMS witnesses, to talk about some of the limitations on that psychomotor skills testing that they currently have to get. Um, again, related to the uh, stress on the EMS system and the availability of responders, Section 20 would also uh, a, create a new entry level um, certification, which would be called the Vermont EMS First Responder. So be a, a more entry level um, person who could be there, one of the first on the scene um, in case of emergency. Now on the bottom of page seven, um, this bill would require a sunset review for DOH. Um, very, it's based on S-233. You did those sunset reviews once every five years for professional regulatory entities to continue to analyze whether all of the continuing competencies are necessary to get to renew your license. And so this would require the same thing for Department of Health. Top of page eight, the EMS Advisory Council, um, it has an annual report to do. And one of the things by their request, as I recall, would be to report on the annual number of mutual aid calls to an EMS area that come from outside that area to address you know, how many EMS uh, services are having to go beyond their normal area to address calls elsewhere. Uh, related to that HRAP provision for the Green Mountain Care Board, again, it just added to their statute, the EMS Advisory Committee statute, that they have to address EMS resources and needs and submit that information to the Green Mountain Care Board for Green Mountain Care Board to include in the HRAP. And then finally for EMS Advisory Committee, they would need to establish an EMS Education Council from among its members for them to sponsor EMS training or education programs um, consistent with what DOH requires for education to be, um, and then also to provide advice to Department of Health regarding the standards for licensure. Uh, Section 21 updates the current list of EMS professionals who may be um, are, who may be able to obtain funding. So there's a statutory funding source for EMS and this would just add to it um, 
licensed EMRs, our current emergency medical responders, because they just weren't on the list, EMTs and paramedics are, so they would add EMRs to it and then also add that new certified um, entry level EMS first responder uh, level as well. So that the people who want to um, get training could potentially get funding for that. Uh, Section 22 provides transitional provisions to implement these changes. Um, there's a de rulemaking deadline of July 1, 21, um, that non-discriminatory qualification for ambulance license types would begin on July 1, 21, or whenever DOH adopts the rules to implement it. Um, in subsection C, in regard to those three levels of EMS instructors, um, that would need to uh, there's language in there to say that the current EMS instructors would be deemed to be at the correct level consistent with their um, scope of practice for whenever there's the three new license levels that are created. So wherever a person fits now, they'd go into the correct one once there's three instead of the current one instructor level. Um, Subsection D requires that establishment of that new entry level certification, Vermont EMS first responder, to be established by July 1, 21. And then finally, subsection E says that Department of Health would need to conduct its first sunset review um, when it has to go through the rulemaking required by this bill. Finally, we get to our last topic in the bill, which is public safety planning. Um, and big picture, what's going on in this uh, section is a requirement for each town to have a public safety plan. Did somebody have a question? Sorry. Yeah, I Bob Hooper has his sort hand. Of do. Uh, so, if I'm reading this correctly, somebody that lives in like Burlington, like I do, or South Burlington, that wanted to do the EMT training at some point in time, I would have to pledge my allegiance to, say, Hal and Winooski or Colchester or someplace else before I would be able to do that because we have professional fire departments in Burlington and South Burlington, I think, that don't take volunteers. Is that exclusionary? And is there a particular reason for it? You mean to be licensed as an EMS professional? Yeah. That requirement for affiliated agency? Yeah. yeah so essentially it means you have to be working for either an ambulance service or a first responder service so that it's not permissible under the law for a person to just call themselves a paramedic and hang out a shingle and be a solo paramedic. You just can't drive around. You have to actually work for an ambulance company or a first responder service. That's what that affiliated agency requirement is. Mm. You can't hold yourself out as Rep Hooper's emergency service provider. <laughs> okay. Seems like it doesn't facilitate a lot of people getting to the point of being that, but maybe I'm missing something. Thanks. And Rob LeClaire. Um, but that wouldn't prevent you or, or preclude you from going through getting the training and getting somewhat certified. It's just that you wouldn't be able to practice. Yeah, it's the same, a same um, you can liken it to the requirement that you to be a law enforcement officer you have to be employed at a law enforcement agency and i you know for example i just can't go out and say get licensed and i'm going to start enforcing the law on my own i actually have to work for a law enforcement agency and so it's the same thing for ems personnel and that's the current law and this bill would just ensure that that's still reflected in the law um, when credentialing got removed. Um, there were just some uh, places where it wasn't as clear that you still had to be affiliated with an affiliated agency. JP. And I also think that um, in that you're not affiliated with any agency, you, you are not eligible for any funding that might be available for the specific EMS uh, type training because there are some available funding. Uh, there is some available funding out there, but it does require the affiliations. Yes, that's correct. And that's, that is the way that the, the law is currently structured. You can't hold yourself out as um, a paramedic, for example, without working for an ambulance service. Yeah. So you can't be a licensed paramedic without 
that affiliation. So Madam Chair, if I might, I'm still puzzled. So the difference between this and um, what happens with the Pittsburgh is that you have to be employed before you can go to Pittsburgh. If Rob is correct, you can do all the coursework and get certified, but not be employed or hang your shingle until you're employed. Is that right? Or you're not even certified until you get the job? I'd have to look back at the EMS rules. A lot of this is set out in rule, how it works. I, I think think that you can get the training as an EMS uh, for, to become licensed, but you you do have to have that affiliation before you can actually practice, but I'd have to confirm or else our um, EMS witnesses can confirm. But the rules, I'd have to real, I pour through the rules. There's a lot of detail in there. I know it's addressed in there somewhere, but I, I just can't tell you with certainty exactly how it's phrased. Um, but it could, it may be that you could get training before you actually get your affiliation. I just, I forget exactly how it works. Okay, thank you. Go back and look at it, sure. All right. All, All right. right, last topic, um, page nine of the summary, it's the public safety planning. Um, so this would be a requirement for each town to have a public safety plan um, that would address the regular um, law enforcement, fire, EMS, and dispatch resources that the town will use. and how, how it's going to address those um, needs for the town. So it's built off the current law requirement for each town um, to analyze its capabilities to respond to all hazards incidents, like emergency issues, like a, a weather disaster. And so every town is already having to review its capacity um, to perform emergency functions in response to an all hazard incident. And so what this would be doing is piggybacking off of that annual requirement where the law already requires each town's local organization to analyze its capacity to perform emergency functions in an all hazards incident. And that local organization would have to, while it's doing that annual analysis, look at what regular resources it has to, to respond to uh, its, its law enforcement, fire, EMS, and dispatch resources to respond to just everyday regular needs. And so it would pass that information on to the legislative body and the legislative body would um, come up with a town public safety plan, which might include partnering with one or more other municipalities or entities to address its regular law enforcement, fire, EMS, or dispatch needs. Um, and so the legislative body would be required to solicit public comment and then propose the town safety plan, hold at least one public hearing on it, and then finally adopt the plan and the process would be repeated for any revisions that are necessary to it. There's a deadline in the bill in section 24 for each town to have one in place by July 1, 23. So it does build out some time for towns to go through this process. And just noted it, there was a section 25 that also related to public safety planning. It was in regard to ACCD public safety planning grants. I think that was also included in S-273 or proposed there, um, but that got removed on the Senate side um, during the appropriations review process. Um, the final thing is the effective date. It's July 1, 2020. So that would need to change um, if you will pursue this bill. Great, Marcia Gardner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, under the public safety planning section, is there anything there that requires the towns to submit their plans to a statewide entity so that that statewide entity can be looking at plans to offer coverage all over the state rather than just in by town by town? There is not, but there is there's not a requirement to submit the town public safety plan to a statewide entity, but the language does, um, does provide that the legislative body of the town can consult with municipal and regional planning commissions, 
neighboring local organizations or any other uh, law enforcement, fire, or EMS service uh, entities um, in order to determine how those services may be provided and shared on a regional basis. Um, that has been a focus of Senate GovOps um, is looking at, you know, instead of maybe every town, town's not addressing this, town's not needing to address their regular public safety needs on a town by town basis, but how those services might be shared regionally. So it does at least have an eye to regional, um, but not a statewide oversight. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great, any other questions from committee members? There's a lot going on there. <clears throat> and so I appreciate um, uh, guiding us through the summary since that is um, that is a very helpful document. Appreciate that. And uh, again, committee, if there are other supporting documents that Betsy Ann has put on our committee page for um, for us to take a look at if we want to put some of this in the larger context. So um, before we switch gears, last chance, any other thoughts, questions, comments, suggestions on 124? We have been given um, a, a fair amount of committee time um, as the uh, as the speaker's office has um, has been helping to schedule committees uh, for this um, remote meeting time. And so you will see us coming back in more depth to a lot of these issues next week, um, particularly after we finish our work on 220, then we will be solely focused on this bill for a while. Um, so any other, any other questions before we move forward? All right, I don't see anybody diving for their hand. Um, so what I, the other thing that we need to accomplish today, and I think we probably have enough time to have this committee discussion, um, is that we need to review a couple of requests from the Appropriations Committee um, with respect to the uh, remainder of this uh, budget year. Uh, there were a few decisions that we had made back in March when the House first considered a full year budget. Um, we, uh, we didn't necessarily have to reaffirm all of them when we passed the Q1 budget in June. Um, but now that we're looking at the remainder of the year's budget, uh, we do need to, to come back and take a look at some of these. And so I'm gonna ask John Gannon if he wants to run us through some of the questions that we've been asked by different members of the Appropriations Committee. And I know that uh, some members of the committee sat in on some joint testimony with appropriations. Um, and so we can have a committee discussion about each of the questions they've asked. Go ahead, John. Thanks. Um, so I'll start with the, the easy budget request first, which is the Sergeant of Arms Office. Um, so uh, the appropriation has asked us a, a couple of questions. Um, one is um, that there is a body camera request for the Sergeant of Arms Office um, in their budget. Um, in March, uh, we did not support that 21,000 um, dollar item. And so the question being posed to us by appropriation is that still our position? And Rob, you unmuted. You want to want to weigh uh, in? Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I would, my preference would be that it would not be our position. I think that we should support that. And if you take a look at other legislation that's being proposed out there, an awful lot of it about is body cam um, usage. And it seems like that our Capitol Police, there's more and more being asked of them as they're having to interact with people inside the state house and outside. And personally, I think it would be a, an appropriate way to help address some of the issues and concerns that, that are out there. I know that part of their request over time has been additional staff 
which I realize is kind of a heavy lift, but to me, this, I think would be an appropriate tool to help them. Uh, Jim Harrison. So I would just um, add, I mean, it sounds like assuming we pass S124 um, at some point in the next couple of weeks, um, we're going to require it anyhow, because it says all law enforcement agencies. So there is some something to be said that whether we do it now or we, whether we do it next year, we're going to do it. Uh, so I think we should consider that. The other point I, I would think that we should consider is um as as the member from Barry Town said, their role has changed. Um, and certainly we saw in the pre uh, several occasions where uh, they had to escort out um, protesters. Um, and I think at some point um, someone's going to accuse somebody of something uh, in terms of, of uh, you know, undo force or whatever uh, in terms of removing somebody and body cams might be um, a good way to get some clear uh, information and video footage as opposed to um, someone taking something on a cell phone that we see not always tell the full story uh, in situations. So I think it, it protects, you know, if it's not a budget breaker, um, we should certainly encourage them to move forward uh, in this direction with body cams because it's going to happen anyhow uh, at some time in the next few years. So Betsy Ann, can you please clarify um, S-124? I don't believe it has a requirement for body cams for all law enforcement agencies. Yes, I, I noted that in the summary at the bottom of page two. I, I do think the language could be clarified. Um, my understanding of the uh, language was to say that if an agency uses body cams, then it shall follow this policy. I think it would be helpful to clarify that in the in the language because right now it just says agencies shall follow the body cam policy and officers need to follow it. But the body cam policy itself says if author if officers are authorized to use body cams, they need to use them in this way. So I don't think S. 124 S124 does not currently mandate all officers to use body cams. And so I think that language would be helpful to clarify in section 9A if you will pursue that language or want to keep it Thank as you for is. that. Yeah. I, I read it the other way. Thank you. Um Marcia Gardner. John, do we know how many units they're asking for? Uh, we do not. Thank you. We just know the cost, which is $21,000. Um, JP. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, Betsy Ann, thank you for your comment just a minute ago here. That was part of two part, two questions of it, or two comments I was going to make. I would it was my interpret or my uh, interpretation of the section that bot body cameras are not required for any all police officers, and it's my understanding that only that the current bills only require Vermont State Troopers to wear the body cams. I believe I'm going to request clarification on that from you. And the second part is whether or not it's required or not for a municipal and or including the Capitol Police Department. I agree 100,000% with, with Representative Harrison's comments that 
we we uh, times are changing and and body cams uh, they provide a very very valuable resource to everything and and I think for that amount of money that uh, Representative Gannon mentioned I mean I think that's money well worth spent and I highly support the uh, expenditure of funds to equip our Capitol Police with body cams and so Betsy Ann if you could just on that when you get a when you get a spare second thank you Madam Chair. Thank you, thank you. Um, yes, I'm looking at your act number 147, which was your S219. And that addressed body cameras in sections seven and eight. And that that required, as you were saying, Representative Pulasic, that was the requirement for Department of Public Safety to ensure that all of its law enforcement officers are equipped with body cameras or otherwise a video recording device. So that was specifically a requirement on Department of Public Safety to use body cameras. But otherwise, um, S-124 just says, if another agency uses body cams, it has to comply with the LEAB policy, but it does not have um, a requirement for all officers to wear body cameras and use them. It's only if they're provided with one, they have to follow the policy, the LEAB policy. So um, just to continue on this thing, I, I, I believe we heard testimony at some point or, or it has come into my mind that we did. And I apologize for not remembering that there are many members that are concerned about having cameras inside the state house. Um, because it could capture private conversations. Um, and, and so I just, I, I understand um, the need for, for body cameras for law enforcement, but I think there's also been concerns raised uh, about capturing members having conversations with various people inside the building. And, and I don't want people to lose sight of that. I agree with you on that and um... You know, interestingly, our our state capitol building doesn't have um, very many places where a member could have a private conversation if one needed to, given that we don't have our own offices, we don't have our own dedicated staff, um, and many of the transactional conversations we have happen quietly in uh, in a hallway conversation or uh, around a cafeteria table. And so I do, I do recall that for a number of years, uh, spanning back to when Chap Smith was uh, Speaker of the House, there have been a number of members who are uncomfortable with the idea of um, videotaping, uh, you know, putting up video surveillance around the building. Um, and I understand that we have made exceptions for that um, during the uh, during the big public events when we have uh, joint assemblies to hear the governor's state of the state address um, and probably uh, you know some other joint assemblies as well. Um, but I would feel uncomfortable making this uh, making this recommendation without including. Uh, input from a, a broader swath of the the body, the House and the Senate, for that matter. Um, Rob, um, I actually share some of the same concerns, especially from the member from Wilmington. But I'm fairly confident that those concerns could be and would be addressed in some sort of uh, I don't know, police protocol or whatever, because. Even now, my understanding is uh, VSB, they have some very strict guidelines about when body cameras are used and when they're not. Um, and I agree, Madam Chair, there's a lot of conversations that happen very casually down there at the State House, and that's a lot of what makes it function. And we wouldn't necessarily want to have everything on camera. No. Uh, JP. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and that's exactly what I was going to say is I think the um, Capitol Police Department uh, could and should have a policy um, directing when 
the body cams would be used, such as when it appeared there there would be some sort of a confrontation um, with with a Pacific person or groups, and you know things things of that nature that the body cam footage would prove instrumental in. But I I also agree that the it's, it's very hard to find a place to have a conversation, a private conversation in the state house with all the recorders and cameras from media and everything there as it is, but with a good policy and due diligence on the officers of the Capitol Police Department, I think that would be, I think the benefit would be substantial to, to them to have those and to be privacy could still be reasonably protected, uh, just my, my opinion. So Betsy, a question. Um, so uh, the, if the Capitol Police were to get body cams, they would have to comply with the statewide policy, um, which might not take into consideration um, some of the issues that, are, that we face at the State House. Um, so we may need to figure out how to solve that, if we if we decide that they should have body cameras, we may, may need to to this to have some carve out language um, for the Capitol Police with respect to body cam policy. Yeah, that makes sense to folks. I mean, yeah. Um, Marcia Gardner, John, do we know if video storage is included in this twenty one thousand or deployment or training? Um, we do not. Thank you. Good question, Marcia. I can find that out, probably. All right. So how, how do we want to leave that? Um, um, I think we should chew on that a little bit. I really feel like uh, I don't feel comfortable making a, a call one way or the other without um, running it by some other uh, members of the House, you know, uh, chairs of other committees. It, it, you know, I know that, that there has been a hard no on cameras in the past and, um, and without without having a clear understanding and, and vetting among, uh, among the House and Senate, I, I, particularly around what the policy is with, uh, you know, with how the data is stored and is it publicly um, accessible, you know, could, could, for instance, the, you know, some political operative, um, uh, make a, a request for that public record uh, and use it for political purposes. You know, I mean, these are all these are all questions that we should consider before we move forward. I think. So let's put a hold on that idea and um, you can run through the the next question. So the the next question involves um, funding for a, a new officer position. Um, there was funding within the Capitol Police budget in in its January recommend, um, but the Sergeant of Arms withdrew that request um, for funding. So the, the question um, is, does GovOps feel, uh, how does GovOps feel about not funding um, this officer position? It would take $84,000 to restore that position. And I believe if we were to recommend restoring that position, it would, the appropriations committee would then have to figure out where to where to find that money. Right. Uh, I mean, that's uh, a tough one. I would feel uncomfortable with the information on that until we hear from the Capitol Police, but yeah. For the sergeant. Yeah, definitely. Jim Harrison. Yeah, I agree. I'm uncomfortable with a new position, even though we are putting more demands on them without knowing more. And that may be a more appropriate conversation for January. Um, and it could be looked at in terms of the any budget adjustment act, uh, if need be. Mm -hmm. 
Good point. We're going to get right into budget adjustment pretty quickly. Um, somebody else had a hand up, but I it disappeared. Rob, go ahead. Um, I, I would agree. I think it's one of those things that we should potentially go back and take a look at. Obviously, uh, without having any more of Crystal Ball, anybody else says, I suspect we're going to have a very hybrid sort of legislative session in the next biennium. And who knows what the demands of Capitol Police are going to be from a staffing perspective. It, it could be significantly less. It could be quite a bit more, depending on what we end up coming up with. So I would agree. I think we need to talk a bit more about that and understand what the needs are. Yeah. And not unlike the, um, the impact to our staff more generally, legislative council staff, as well as committee support staff and IT staff, this, um, this year has been a roller coaster of, um, of new intensities and different intensities and more continuous, um, more continuous work than a typical year where you know the the building is used more by by tourists and tour buses in the summertime um, in a normal year, and this year the building has been relatively quiet. But of course, when the challenges of uh, a hybrid or remote meeting um, come together in January, it's going to put a different set of uh, challenges in front of our. Capitol Police and just want to acknowledge that and be sensitive to uh, to them and to all of the people who make our legislative work happen. Um, it's it's complicated, uh, but we should definitely keep the communication lines open. JP. Thank you, and, and I agree with what you just said, Madam Chair. Um, I have always thought that the number of Capitol Police officers has been less than desirable and, and needed to provide for the protection of everybody that uses the, the, the uh, people's house. Um, the, the, the current situation with the, with the pandemic, I think probably has put a little less demand on the Capitol Police but when, and I'm really hoping that is very soon, obviously, that we go back to normal operations, um, I really think that even adding, or excuse me, adding even only one officer to the force would um, be really beneficial to everybody's personal safety. And on a personal end, if it was the budgetary requirements and trying to find the money, I would uh, much rather give up that, uh, John, did you say that was 17,000 for body yeah, cam? For the body. I, I, how 20, much was it? 21,000. 21,000, okay. Uh, I would rather give up the body cams and add a police officer. Uh, I just think that's the personal safety issues of everybody in that building, including, you know, everybody. It's, it's, it's not just the legislators and, and the, uh, the staff, legislative staff, everybody, it's the public as well. And uh, again, uh, the sooner the better if we could add somebody once we go back to oper the normal operations, that would be great. Thank you. So I, I guess what I'm hearing is that we should postpone this until January. Um, especially when we, and given Rob's comments, when we have a better idea of how we're coming back, right. um, you know, what type of hybrid model um, will exist and what will be the demands on the Capitol Police given that model. Mm -hmm. Is that a fair statement of our position? That, that would be my position. I agree with the esteemed member from Barrytown but we are talking just about the additional law enforcement position. We're going to go back and revisit the body cams. Yes. We're going to get more information. And I think Sarah said she was going to reach out um, to others um, to get a, a larger idea of the, the position on that. Great. So this is, yeah. This is just with respect to the officer. Okay. Thank you. 
All right, so, so that's the, the Sergeant of Arms budget. Now we move on to the Department of Public Safety, um, which I, I know a number of us sat in on the appropriations hearing um, uh, on that issue. Um, so there's a couple issues there. Um, as I, I think, you know, those who sat in on the, um, the testimony, um, they heard Commissioner Sherling um, comment with respect to um, 219, S219, um, that it, that the language needed to be tweaked um, because it required all Vermont state police officers, um, regardless if they were in the field or not, um, to wear body cams. Uh, so the, the, and the, so Meta Townsend has suggested that, and, and the commissioner suggests that we tweak that language. Um, and she has, or legislative council has suggested just putting in the words in the field. So it would, you know, limit body cams um, to officers, Vermont State Police troopers who are in the field. And I think my only concern about that is I think we've heard testimony from the Vermont State Police that if there's an emergency, everyone, including, including the Colonel, Colonel Birmingham, goes out if necessary. So uh, I, I do realize that there's probably, you know, limited times that he's out in the field, but I, I just raise that as, as a question, um, whether just in the field is sufficient um, language. When I read this proposal, I thought it seemed a little too, simple to be um, to be complete in terms of achieving what we had hoped to achieve. So I would like to see us dig into this a little bit more and understand what that means in practice. Uh, Rob. Uh, well, how about if we re reverse engineer this and say, okay, so what, what do we want the body cams to capture what do we want them to do is it law enforcement's interaction just with the general public um i mean it would seem to me if we could figure out what we want it to do then we could figure out how we want to say it yeah I mean, well there's a the yeah i mean there's a broad range of of activities that the vermont state police might engage in um, through the course of uh, their work week, some of them being traffic stops, some of them being called to domestics, some of them, um, you know, there, there may be other, um, there may be other activities that, that the Vermont State Police do that we wouldn't want to necessarily see captured on, uh, on a body cam, uh, and so I think we need to understand uh, a better way of delineating, not, not this blanket in the field statement. So uh, JP, your hand is up. Sorry about that. No question? Okay. So All right. Lingering question here. Well, what, what I can do is, is I think um, what I recall, and Jim and Marsha who are, and who else was, was in appropriations at that time, is that the, the um, Commissioner Sherling did give specific examples of types of Vermont state police um, troopers that, that were not in the field. So I could reach out to him and just see if he has um, some ideas about um, better char characterizing or categorizing um, the types of, of Vermont State Police staff that would never be in the field. Yep. Would that be acceptable, acceptable to everyone? Okay, I, I will. I think so. I will do that and I, I will reach back out to Meta and just let her know that we're, we're doing that. Yeah. Okay, so we're, we're not finished yet. Um, Bob Hooper, so I think, has a question. Hold on. Well, John, it is, I mean, it, it is how deep you want to dig. I, when I worked in Waterbury, living in Burlington, I got pulled over one day on 
Bolton Flats, and the guy that walked up to the car was Colonel Sinclair, who just happened to be following me. So <laughs> any of the uniformed troopers of any rank, I mean, they're obligated to do what they need to do when they need to do. So it, it's, it's a deeper hole than, I mean, we do need to dig into it a little bit more, I think. All right. Well, I'll at least reach out to the commissioner and um, see, see what his response is and then, you know, share it with everybody and then we can uh, uh, decide what we'll do. Okay. Does that make sense? Because that, that is, no, and I agree with you, Bob. I mean, you know, most uniform officers are, could be in the field at any point if there's a, a crisis, an emergency, or, or they happen to be following you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now I want to know what you did. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> yeah, you can't just leave us hanging on that one, Bob. Um, I, he pulled me over because I was going a, a little too fast. But unlike Howard Dean at the time, I wasn't reading a newspaper or, you know, any of that. Um, and because I was driving a van and it had double doors in the back with a pillar in the middle, you can't see on an unmarked car when the little light is on the dashboard. So I'm just happily motoring along with him back there. Uh, it was interesting. Moving on. Okay. So, so moving on as folks that are in appropriations will recall, um, I believe um, the department of public safety had in their budget um, an additional, and I think it was seven positions um, for mental health workers. So trying to, you know, they, they have mental health workers or social workers and I think two barracks right now. Um, so they wanted to increase that by seven. Um, I, I didn't see a problem with that when I was in appropriations. I thought that was a great idea. Um, but House Health Care has raised some concerns about it. Um, so uh, they're concerned about the proposed model. Um, will we'll not increase rather than decrease this disparity in treatment among residents by law enforcement. So what they propose is setting up is setting up a meeting between healthcare appropriations and me and Rob uh, to, to discuss this, um, their concerns. Well, Rob, Rob, you and I are the Department of Public Safety people on GovOps. Yes, right. <laughs> Just it was the first I'd heard of the proposed meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for volunteering. Well, Meta proposed it uh, yesterday at um, seven ten p.m. Okay. Uh, so was it, there's a yeah, good reason was, you haven't heard. <laughs> that was a that was a voluntold, I think. <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate the uh, the extra work you're putting in on that. So th those are those are the two issues um, on the Department of Public Safety. So we'll get back once we meet with healthcare and appropriates on the um, healthcare, uh, the social the social workers, and I will reach out to Commissioner Sherling about um, body cams. Great. And what else? I have to some. Uh, I have to do something else too. Oh, and I'll reach out to. Uh, I don't know, either a probes. I'll, I'll reach out to Diane first and see if she has data, if the, the budget includes training and storage for the Capitol Police body camps. Jim has his hand up patiently. Yeah, it's not a question on what uh, John has covered, but um, I was copied on the spreadsheet for the Secretary of State's uh, restatement it was only a $37,000 decrease. Um, I've talked to Representative Townsend who does that section of the budget. She also shared that in addition to that reduction, which was like a less than 1%, um, she said the, the appropriations uh, finance budget is um, take an additional transfer of I think she said 340,000. I may have that number wrong. So um, she was very happy with it. So I don't think they were looking for any 
recommendation from us, but I just wanted to share that they've at least tried to keep us in the loop. Thank you. Rob? Um, are, do you anticipate, Madam Chair, other parts of this uh, proposed budget coming into us? I understand it, um, for instance, there might be um, some money's out there floating around for mail-in balloting for school budgets and things like that. Are, are, you, are you aware or feeling there may be other parts that will be coming to us in the next week or so? So that, uh, what I understand about that is that it was a discrete um, proposal that was put into the governor's budget recommend uh, right at the sort of the last minute before it was presented to the legislature. And um, the Secretary of State's office is aware that the administration is putting money in um, to be used for uh, mailing ballots if it is necessary in March. Um, and I'm happy to, happy to have that conversation if, um, if the committee would like to, just knowing that we have, uh, we have a big lift ahead of us in S124 and 220. Um, so we don't have endless amounts of time to, to take a bunch of testimony on, um, on the budget issues, but happy to, happy to hear a little more about that. I'm sure around voting it'd be non-controversial. Right, we can have another set of conversations around mailing ballots, that would be great. Uh, anything else, John, that you want to put on our radar? Um, I, I know I got an email on the state auditor's budget. I have to, I have to take a look at that. Um, I have not yet been sort of wrapped up in cannabis, um, which hopefully will resolve itself on Monday, knock on wood, one way or the other. <laughs> Don't you have 24 hours in a day like everybody else to get stuff done? <laughs> I don't know. Sure thing. All right, Betsy Ann, is there anything that you can think of that you want to put on our radar before we sign off for the weekend? Nope, I'm good. Just have Great. a happy weekend. Thank you. Uh, so we will uh, we'll do some work on assembling our committee uh, agenda for next week uh, so that we can come back to some of these questions. And um, so stay tuned. We, we have our, we have our time slots for next week. And I don't know if I can put my hands on those uh, immediately at the moment, but, um, but I will try to work with Andrea uh, this afternoon early and we can get an agenda finalized and, and posted so that members of the public can know which of these scintillating conversations they want to join us for. All right, holler if you need me. And I think that's all we have for work today.